wonderful episode, and we have an incredible guest uh, named Areed Blackman, PhD, that we'll be talking to. But before we get started, I would like to rec recognize our sponsor who have been there with us for this week with Sabir from the very beginning. It's um, a Restream. That's how we actually stream our show uh, every week that we go with uh, show, bring you this program. It's an incredible platform. Uh, check out the description of the show and the link, special link for a special offer uh, from Restream to all of our viewers. And here's our guest, uh, Reed Blackman. And uh, Reed is a PhD and he is the founder and CEO of Virtue. In that capacity, he works with senior leaders of organizations to uh, integrate ethics and ethical risk mitigation into the company culture and the development, deployment, and procurement of digital products. And um, to just tell you a bit more, I mean, he's been involved in a lot of different things. Uh, to kind of give you a, a brief synopsis of it, he has been a senior advisor to Ernst & Young, sits on the AI advisory board, and is a member of IEEE Ethically aligned design initiative and EU AI Alliance, you know, he's busy, busy, busy man. <laughs> you know? But I'm bad at what I do, so it's not a lot of work. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, he has been profiled in, in, in amazing uh, publications like the Wall Street Journal, Dell Perspectives, uh, TechCrunch, Harvard Business Review, you name it, you know. Uh, he has been coded everywhere, uh, you know, and uh, his, his actually prior, Prior to founding uh, Virtue, Reed was a professor of philosophy at Colgate University and a fellow at Parr Center for Ethics at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Uh, his research has been published everywhere. He's phenomenal. European Journal of Philosophy, the Canadian Journal of Philosophy, uh, the British Journal uh, for the History of Philosophy, and, and many more. Uh, but it's interesting, besides being a professor, <laughs> he likes fireworks. <laughs> you know, so it's it's good to have a different aspect to all of us. You know, I like so, selling fireworks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he was wholesaling fireworks, and uh, he's a flying trapeze uh, 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 instructor. Also, uh, he got his BA from Cornell University, a PhD from uh, the University of Texas Austin, and, and a BA from Cornell, uh, fr and an MA from Northwestern University. Well, Reed, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Yeah. I think we're going to have a great time. Uh, so when we th think about data and we think about AI, uh, it's um, there are, I mean, the obvious things are there are AI algorithms. There is data collection. I have been involved in e-commerce and, and digital since the birth of digital in, in the very beginning when it became public. So I would say close to like mid 90s or early 90s, something like that. So I've been, I'm an OG in that field. Uh, so the, there's the data part of it, but then there's the ethical aspect of of data collection, right? And then when we fast forward that into well, where we are in 2020 right now, it's the kind of the uh, thinking about the kind of ethical use of that knowledge and using uh, AI algorithms to bring uh, intelligence, whether we're swapping faces or we're, we're creating characters and stuff like that, or robots and androids to help us uh, uh, with our everyday chores or become military, you know? Uh, so, I mean, there are many, many uses of it. I mean, right now we are in 2020 and, and it's uh, the, the kind of the, um, the growth I've seen from the mid nineties to 2020 now, I'm, I'm amazed at how much we have, uh, you know, come forward in, from, from that perspective. So from, from there, like, let's start with the very basic, like, what is ethics related to data and, and AI? Yeah, um, cool. So um, so first of all, thanks for having me. Um, I think this will be fun. I could be wrong, maybe it'll be miserable. I don't know yet, let's find out. <laughs> so, no, we yeah. will have a ton of fun. I love this topic. Okay, we'll see, we'll see. Um, so, so, okay, the question is something like, what's AI ethics? Um, so look, first of all, just think about what ethics is. Um, it's, it's in a way, it's not that complicated. Um, doing ethical inquiry is complicated. Just sort of being familiar with ethical issues, concepts, et cetera, not that complicated. So, you know, we talk about ethics every day. What are our obligations to each other? What's the right thing to do? What's the wrong thing to do? What's the courageous thing to do? Um, you know, we think about what kinds of obligations uh, and rights doctors and patients have, for instance. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're well versed in talking about ethical issues on a daily basis. Now, when it comes to AI ethics, 
it's not that all the issues are totally new, it's just that they get exacerbated when it comes to AI. So I don't know how familiar your audience is with, I mean, do you have a sense of how familiar your audience is with, with AI or machine learning? No, let's let's take them through it because some some of this stuff might be a bit more technical, right? Yeah. So let's let's uh, uh, simplify it for them for kind of a general audience. Yeah. So it's so it's easy. Okay. So look, first of all, you know you can you can talk about two different kinds of AI. There's narrow it. There's narrow AI and there's general AI. General AI is the Terminator and consciousness and living creature, you know, quasi living or living creatures um, built out of artificial parts. Yada yada. Okay. No one's talking about that. Uh, at least people are talking about it, but we're not in business, right? And when we're talking about business and the sort of work that I do with clients, the issue is not general artificial intelligence. We're worried about the Terminator kicking down the door. Okay. So what are we talking about? We're talking about narrow AI um, and the vast majority of narrow AI, which I'll hereafter just call AI, is machine learning. And that sounds really complicated and it sounds scary and intimidating, but in concept, it's extremely easy. It's just like this. A piece of machine learning or AI learns by example. That's all it is. That's all it really does. It learns by example. So you want it to recognize pictures of your dog, give it a thousand pictures of your dog, and say, "Hey, listen, you know, this is my dog." Um, and you know, let's call the dog. Uh, who's your sponsor again? Restream. This yep. is my dog. Restream. Give it another plug. This is my dog. Restream. <laughs> um, Whenever I upload a new picture of my doggy restream, I want my my software to know that you know to label it restream doggy you know dog restream, and if it's not um, a picture of either a dog or it's not my dog, then it's uh, you know then don't label it that label it not restream or something like that. And so the what the software does is it looks through those one thousand examples that you've given of what your dog looks like, it tries to find a, the similarities across all of those pictures. And then if it sees that same similarity, that same pattern that holds across those 1,000 photos, if it sees that pattern exhibited in the 1,000 first photo, it'll say, yes, that's Restream again. It'll label it Restream. Otherwise, it won't. So that's that's basic machine learning. It learns by example. So it's, instead of you having to go in there and say, if it has two eyes and a nose and it's this far apart, well, you can't do that. But it, it can learn from those examples. Very cool. So. I could, should, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes it makes total sense. If you think about, because there was something that I saw, I, I just don't remember it well enough, um, uh, that currently at the stage that humanity is in as far as our artificial intelligence goes, and there's a lot of scary movies out there, you sure. know, that scare, scare the hell out of you thinking that robots are gonna rise and, and you know, everybody's gonna be dead and they will take control of us, you know? Yeah. Uh, but I think where we are, I, I think ma machine learning is the kind of stage zero, like the very base stage of, of uh, learning, right? Uh, can, can you go over the, the next stages of it? Like artificial intelligence is another one, but when does it actually become responsive where, where it's, it's beyond just, just normal intelligence that it actually, like a baby grows up right now, right? It, it yeah. eventually knows to go to the bathroom and, and when to eat and when to cry and when to change clothes. Yeah. Uh, and becomes as it becomes more adult, knows how to take care of other, other uh, smaller beings and stuff like that. Sure. So, what are those stages when when it comes to AI? I mean, so look, um, there's a general. There's one question, which is something you know, a philosophical question like, what is consciousness? What is it to be a living creature? What is it to be a conscious creature? Right. So there's there's that question. Um, whatever the answer to that is, we're nowhere near that with our AI nowhere near it. Machine learning in a way is, you know, there's a way in which it's kind of stupid. Mm -hmm. um, it could learn from those examples. So, you know, there are some famous examples where you show um, a thousand pictures of a bus mm -hmm. and it learns what buses look like. And then you give it another picture of a bus, but you, you invert the picture, it's upside down. Or you show it from an angle that's, that it hasn't seen a bus before and, and it has no idea what it is, right? So there's, so there's a long way to go. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so I, mean, I don't know if that really answers your question, but we're, like you said, we're at stage zero, and it's not as though it's um, they're they're always trying to figure out new ways of doing AI, of, you know, new kinds of neural networks, and they're always making advancements, right? So a bunch of years ago, I forgot how many years ago, they figured out how to program AI or how to train how to train an AI algorithm to beat Gary Kasparov at chess, um, mm -hmm. and now relatively recently, I love chess, by the way. 
Well, you're not as good I as actually, computers. <laughs> I actually just played chess with my son just before mm -hmm. this interview. <laughs> Are you big on Queen's Gambit now too? Uh, uh, I just finished it. I didn't. I didn't do it yet. I'm on. I'm gonna, <laughs> so I'm, I'm not on. gonna. I'm gonna not gonna. Uh, and also, I want to give a uh, uh, give a shout out to a, a good uh, producer friend of mine uh, who actually uh, uh, produced a new movie called Critical Thinking. If you love chess, you, you would love her movie. Um, you know, so it's, it's something that you should definitely check out. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, yeah. So you know. So you can get a computer to beat someone in chess, a, a master player at chess, but we couldn't get the, they couldn't, engineers couldn't figure out how to be a master at Go. But relatively recently, they've done that. So Deep DeepMind figured out how to program an AI to play Go better than, you know, one of the best players in the history of the game. You know, mm -hmm. so we're just, we're, there's there's incremental improvements and incremental improvements. Um, Look, one people, one thing that your your audience might not know is that the general thing, the general concepts that have been um, around cur what current day AI looks like have been around since about the fifties, the nineteen fifties. Mm -hmm. But in order for machine learning to work, you need at least two things that they didn't have in the fifties. Number one, you needed an insane amount of data, right? So I give you the example of um, your dog and having a thousand pictures of your dog. But suppose you're trying to train your AI to read tens of thousands of resumes and see whether or not that resume is deserving of an interview. The person whose resume is of deserves an interview or you know, do they get a green light or a red light? Should they be approved or, or, or um, disapproved for a mortgage or a loan? Um, what should their insurance premium be, right? These are really complicated things. What should their credit limit be? These are really complicated things and it requires a tremendous amount of data that frankly just wasn't had in the 1950s, not, not collected, not aggregated. So you need a ton of data. You need the ability to store all that data. And then you also need a tremendous amount of processing power in order to run through all these examples, right? We're talking about, you know, what, what, uh, what, what's the biggest byte now? I forgot what the biggest byte now, not, you know. Pentabytes? Yeah, like bigger than a petabyte. I think a terabyte, is a terabyte better, bigger than a? Well, technically the name Google <laughs> is, is, is a number, yeah. right? Yeah. So. Yeah. So if you're going to run through all of this data, then you need the processing power to do that, which we didn't have until relatively recently. So the truth is that the main concepts, the things that, that engineers are doing now in AI, most of it has existed for a long time, at least in concept. It's just that we now have the, if you like, the physical ability to pull it off. Mm -hmm. Now, now when, when we talk about like the ethics of it, like what yeah. are the biggest ethical dilemmas of, um, you know, when it comes to like AI and big data, because AI and big data for the past 25 years of my career, I've used uh, quite a lot of that. It wasn't AI part of it. It was more like big data. And I, cl yeah. I, I collected a lot of data to to grow these businesses like this, you sure. know, so it could you could weaponize data in a, in a positive yeah. way to actually help humanity. Yeah. Oh, oh, what are some of those? What are, what are the biggest ethical di dilemmas? Because I'm a yeah. nice guy. What yeah. if I was not a nice guy? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, okay, there's a, a number of things to say here. So first of all, I'm gonna assume that your audience is a business audience. Yeah. As opposed to say a bunch of regu you know, regulators or something like that, or, you know, that I, I you know, the Bill Gates Foundation or something. Um, and so that, and that incidentally is, those are my clients. I talk to business people. So what I like to do first is to, is, is to distinguish between, when you're talking about AI ethics, there's this AI for good crowd. Mm -hmm. So AI for good, the AI for good crowd wants to figure out how do we use all this data and the power of AI to carry out, you know, our social impact missions to, to have a great impact on the world. That's one thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, another way to look at it, though, and this is the, this is the way I think businesses primarily look at it, unless we're talking about CSR, is AI for not bad. How do we just not screw things up, ethically speaking, and thus reputationally speaking, in doing whatever businessy thing that we're doing? You know. Either the, the goal of the business is to um, produce some ethically valuable things or that they're at the very least ethically neutral, one hopes, they're not ethically bad. The question is, in the course of pursuing those ethically neutral or ethically good goals, how do we do that in a way that doesn't screw us up ethically and reputationally? Not to mention inv inviting regulatory investigation. Okay, so now there are three main things that you wanna focus on. Um, there's a lot, but the three hottest topics in AI, for, AI ethics or AI for not bad. The first is privacy, as you mentioned. So the fuel of machine learning is data. 
because you have to train this thing on data. That means it's your data, it's my data, it's your listeners' data, and so on. So what that means is that the engineers have an incentive to violate people's privacy, collect more data than people are comfortable with, because they need that to fuel their AI systems. And so that's one major risk. And that comes along, as you've noted, whether you're doing AI or not. If you're just doing sort of big data, just basic you know, non-machine learning data analytics, you still need a lot of data, which means that you're incentivized to violate people's privacy. That's one big issue. Another issue when it comes to machine learning is explainability. So a lot of the decisions, the, the outputs of the machine or the machine learning software, the AI, we don't know how it came to that output because the patterns that this thing is recognizing, they're so complicated that we humans can't wrap our heads around it. So again, let's go back to um, your dog Restream. You gave it a thousand pictures and you know what Restream looks like and so do I. The way that the, and we look at its eyes and its ears and the, the color and the shading of it and you know, blah, blah, blah. The, the AI software is looking at, that, at those pictures at the pixel level and it's identifying pictures on the pixel level. So when it says, oh, this new picture that you uploaded is a picture of your dog, it's because it matches a pattern of pixels that you and I can't possibly track. We're talking about thousands and thousands of pixels and the relations among those thousands of, of the pixels. That's just too complicated of a pattern for us to put in our heads, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you're, say, explaining why this person has a high risk score for probation, which is going on, um, has gone on, or why they're denied a mortgage, or why they're denied a job interview, or why they're matched with this person on the dating site, or whatever. And you can't explain why you're doing those things, why, why they're getting diagnosed with cancer, if you're using a di uh, AI as a, di uh, as a diagnostic. diagnostic. If you can't explain those outputs, there's a number of situations in which that's really ethically problematic. Hey, listen, the machine says you're high risk for flight, um, for committing another crime, so you're not gonna get probation. That's, that's impactful. Uh, and mm -hmm. it seems pretty ethically screwed up if you can explain to someone why they're getting the treatment that they are. And then the very last thing I'll point out is that the other big, if not the biggest issue in AI ethics is bias. Which you'll call it, what you're here about is biased algorithms. So there's a variety of ways that happens, but it ultimately amounts to the outputs being discriminatory against some particular subpopulation, say black people or black women or people of color generally or so on and so forth. So. Um, there's one, you know, right now, uh, um, who is it? Oh, Optum. Op, uh, Optum um, had a, has a um, piece of AI software that recommends to practitioners in hospitals, healthcare practitioners in hospitals, who to pay attention to, who need, who's in need of help. Um, mm -hmm. And it turns out that it systematically um, recommends to doctors and nurses to pay more attention to white patients than to sicker black patients. And there's various reasons why that's the case. It wasn't because the programmers were, were racist. It's mm -hmm. because there's various ways of having biased data sets that lead to biased slash discriminatory outputs. Um, and so there's lots of ways to wreak havoc. So no, Optum is under investigation for that. Um, Goldman is under investigation for allegedly discriminatory credit limits um, that were biased against women with, the, um, with their Apple card. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, so privacy, explainability, um, and bias are the three main issues. Um, and then there's just all sorts of ways that things can go wrong because of the use case, because of people with bad intentions using it um, intentionally for evil ends, so on and so forth. Anyway, sorry for the lecture, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a professor, so that's that's perfectly fine. Yeah. Now, if I if I look at um, uh, look back in human history, right? Uh, one of the uh, evolutions that happened was the industrial evolution, right? When machines came into existence, there was mass and unemployment. But that also, you know, that was a negative side of the, you know, advancement in human in humanity. Yeah. But the but the positive side of it was now production was a lot faster. You could actually make products more affordable, so that it becomes uh, it becomes more attainable and available for yeah. more masses. You know, yeah. when it, when you are talking about uh, AI and aut automation and certain things like that. Uh, what what do you see from a because I can see the mass unemployment. This is the next evolution of mass un unemployment coming up, right? Yeah. Where now the uh, certain types of machines have the AI to. It doesn't have to be robots, you know. Uh, it could be um, you know machines that are that have the intelligence of production. Yeah. And you now 
that's going to hurt certain industries from a em human employment uh, perspective. Yeah. So what, what are your thoughts on, on that AI slash automation type thing with yeah. this kind of mass unemployment? Yeah, no, I think it's really worrying and that the worries about it are largely downplayed by the tech community. So look, um, you're right. So AI is, you know, it automates processes um, and it scales them. You know, AI is just made to scale stuff, right? So um, when you have a negative impact like that, it's going to be pretty big, right? So if when we get to the day when AI can drive cars well enough, say trucks well enough across country, um, and it can do that without having to go to sleep, without needing a lunch break, could drive through the night, et cetera, only needs to stop for gas. Um, you know, that's gonna disrupt millions of jobs. Now, the, your, your reference to the industrial revolution is really helpful um, because it's one thing that a lot of people like to talk about. They say, look, the industrial revolution happened and it actually created more jobs than it destroyed. Now, now we have office workers, which we didn't really have pre-industrial revolution. There's not a lot more office work now as opposed to um, manufacturing work or something like that, or um, apprenticeship work. The, but here's, there are two problems with this, as, as this, you know, this, this should not let people, we shouldn't be off the hook because of this for two reasons. Number one, an appeal to the industrial revolution is a, is a sample size of one, hmm. right? It's an N of one. It's like, okay, yeah, that's what happened with the industrial revolution. Um, but that's not sufficient evidence for thinking that any time there's a kind of productive revolution, it's always going to create more jobs um, than it will destroy. Like I said, you can infer that from your evidence case of one. So who, maybe this could be the first time it created more than it destroyed, and the next productive revolution, it destroyed more jobs than it created. That's perfectly possible. Um, so that's one thing to say. The, and I actually think it's quite likely. The second thing to say is, all right, let's grant for the sake of argument that it's going to create more than it destroys. Let's grant that. Nonetheless, you're still going to have at least a generation or two generations who don't have the requisite education or skills to occupy those new jobs. So you're going to lose a generation or two or more um, because though there's going to be a huge percent of the population who can't occupy those newly created jobs because they just don't have the education or skills for it. So best case scenario, you're going to put mass amounts of people for in, into poverty for generations. That's best case scenario. Well, so if, um, now, now, cause in, in my first iteration of my career, I was a programmer, right? So I, I, I've actually programmed in many, many different languages, oh. you know, a variety of them. Actually, I have a computer science degree. That's, that's the extent of my programming background. Right now, I, I run businesses. That's what I do now. Sure. But when you when you think about kind of the responsibility, right? Like if I wrote a piece of code uh, like ten years ago, if I wrote a piece of code, if it's uh, something wrong with it, I have to go in and I have to fix, debug it, and fix it, yeah. right? And depending on the extent of that, let's say if it was credit card processing and I was not processing credit cards, that means that a lot of goods went out the <laughs> went out the warehouse for free. Yeah. And I never charge those credit cards. Yeah. That's a pretty big mistake, you know. Yeah. But but when it comes to uh, AI type things, like wh where does the responsibility lie in that kind of a, a scenario? When when you have you know, because uh, you you want the systems to be machine learning and self learning and healing and stuff like that, right? But wh where do you draw the line and say that okay, you know what, this is a uh, this is where the responsibility lies. It's the programmer. It's the company. It's the government. I mean, it would touch many different responsible parties, yeah. especially depending on the on the on the role of the AI, whether it was a robot or it was a kitchen appliance. You know, yeah. Uh, is it the with the programmers? Is it the manufacturer? Where do you draw the line and say that person is responsible? Yeah. So look, there's first of all, there's it's um, the question is you know something like who is responsible, not which is the one that's responsible which is just to say that there's lots of parties that can be responsible, right? So the company did this, um, which led the programmer to do that. Um, but had the government had the proper kinds of regulations, none of that would have happened. So there's an extent to which it's the government's fault. Um, the programmer did this, but he or she um, did it in a sort of reckless way, so they're responsible. But the product manager who's overseeing those that team didn't check for that, so they're responsible. But the C-suite executive who oversees all this um, never gave the right sort of incentive structures to their product managers, et cetera, et cetera, right? So there's plenty of responsibility to go around. Um, look, 
from your audience's perspective, here's what's going on. The, the con consumers and employees are holding the companies responsible, at least partly, right? They're holding the company mm -hmm. responsible. So people hold Facebook responsible. Um, their reputation is tarnished, at least in the States, because of all the crazy things that have gone on over there. Um, and regulators will hold the companies responsible. Um, I wouldn't put the onus on individual programmers by any means because they exist inside of a structure that encourages or discourages them taking the ethical considerations, the ethical risks seriously. Mm -hmm. Risks are, the ethical and reputational risks are large. They're too large for one person to handle. And they're certainly too large for one person on a team of engineers to address. Um, if that person is not financially incentivized, if it, it runs counter their, to, their, to their promotion bonus, et cetera, to take those things seriously, um, then they're not going to do it, right? Um, same thing with their colleagues, with their peers, same thing with their boss. So at the end of the day, what companies need to do is implement a kind of AI ethical risk program where it's driven throughout the organization. Someone mm -hmm. in that organization needs to own that program. So something like a chief data officer, for instance, can own that ethics, ethical risk program, um, but it gets um, populated throughout the organization or, or tr uh, you know, translated throughout the organization by ensuring that there are role specific responsibilities so that the data collectors have certain responsibilities um, to make sure that at least the ethical nightmares aren't realized. The developers have certain responsibilities in their, in their capacity as developers. So too with the product managers. There's a certain level of um, education, organizational awareness that's needed. There needs to be a way of um, that people are trained to smell ethical smoke and when they do smell ethical smoke, there's alarm to be pulled. And that alarm goes to the relevant deliberative body. And that deliberative body has the capacities to make well-informed decisions on what their proper risk mitigation strategies are. So. You know, when you talk about the responsibility of a business, there should be a senior leader, someone in the C-suite um, overseeing the maintenance of a program, but that program has to include world-specific responsibilities so that everyone in the organization has some level of responsibility. Now, now when, when you're talking about ethics, right, the, um, it's interesting, like, I, I don't, I don't want to be religious here, right? Yeah. But just to think about, because it, it is a code, right? A Bible is a code. You know, sure. Any other religious texts that are out there, uh, they're kind of a code of conduct and code of ethics and how you're supposed yeah. to perform. Uh, if you look at those religions, uh, the, the, the oldest one, uh, I, don't, I don't know much about the religious history. So if I'm wrong, I apologize to my audience members. You know, <laughs> yeah. like, let's say if we could go with more popular religions that exist, uh, that are very popular nowadays, uh, something like Judaism or Christianity or Islam or, or Hinduism, uh, it has existed for, I don't know, tens of thousands of years, mm -hmm. right? Before that, I mean, you, you, if you take the Bible as an example, and I, I, this is not a Bible study, but take it. The, the the crime that was committed by Cain and Abel and you know that first crime or something like that and the ethics related to that I think we it took humanity I would say tens of thousands of years for us to come up with a code of conduct and ethics and how we are supposed to act and behave mm -hmm. right and 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 robotics and AI and data is relatively even though the data collection was there, but not at the at the degree it's being collected today, yeah. right? And we're trying to we're trying to squeeze in right ten thousand years of religion <laughs> because it is kind of a religion. The digital and and what we are talking about with AI, it is a religion. You have to have a code of conduct. You have code of ethics. You have to have code of how we're supposed to behave, right? We're squeezing that into just several years. What are your thoughts on that? So I wouldn't, so there's a couple of things to say. Number one, I wouldn't necessarily connect ethics with religion, even if you might always connect religion with ethics. So it's true that religions- As an example, as yeah, an example. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm inclined to say that probably all religions have some kind of um, ethical standards associated with it, um, but it's not the case that all ethical standards have um, some religious orientation. So there are secular ethics. That's one thing to say. The second thing to say is if you want to look for a place where um, organizations have successfully integrated ethical risk mitigation into their operations, um, into strategy, into product development, so on and so forth, just look to healthcare. 
So the healthcare industry has done, not a perfect by any means, but a very good job overall of integrating ethical risk mitigation into um, operations, product development, so on and so forth, right? So you have uh, professional medical ethicists, you know, academics, you have regulators, you have regulations, um, you have policymakers, you have um, very clear protocols. For instance, respect for persons translates to respect for autonomy, um, which means or uh, entails among other things that informed consent is required before performing a pr procedure on someone, right? So there might be some high level ethical principle like you should respect people um, and that amounts to, at least in part, that you don't treat them in a way that they don't consent to be treated. And so now there's a, you know, there's a physical form, right, that someone is tasked with the responsibility of giving that form to the patient, helping them to understand what that form says, and making sure that they have meaningful informed consent before they start performing that operation. And that if someone says, I don't want that, even if it's a life-saving treatment, um, it's still, um, it's still um, embedded in our healthcare system that people have a right to refuse treatment. Um, and so even if it's life-saving, doctors still don't have a right, um, ethical or legal right to perform that operation in, in the absence of the, um, the consent of the person. Um, that's not sort of highfalutin, you know, that's not religion, that's not building 10,000 years of ethical inquiry into a few years. Thoughts about ethics and ethical risk mitigation and operationalizing ethics, um, both for its own sake and for the sake of preserving reputation and frankly, for the sake of a competitive advantage, right? Trustworthiness is a competitive advantage. Um, that's mm -hmm. been going on for decades in the healthcare industry. And that's exactly what needs to go on in, in most companies now who are dealing with big data, AI, et cetera. So um, how do you think companies are, actually, before I ask that question, um, to me, because the thing is, I've I've traveled all my life, and I have you know, relatives from all over the world. You know, uh, what I think, uh, and and my cousins keep on reminding me that just go with your American severe. Don't don't say whatever, <laughs> whatever like Turkish. Don't I'm Turkish, but they don't they go like don't say Turkish because you don't behave like a Turk, you know, at all. So just call <laughs> yourself American, right? Yeah, but the, the reason Turkish I share food, that- the Turkish it, food is better than American food, so yeah. just talk about it. The, the reason I bring that up is w when you look at a subject like ethics, and especially in, in artificial intelligence, right? Ethics is very cultural, right? Uh, for example, I'm, I'm gonna talk about something extremely controversial, cannibalism, for example. To a yeah. cannibal, it's perfectly fine, right? Yeah, yeah. But when it comes to uh, anyone in the Western world or anywhere else that doesn't eat another human, it's completely unethical, right? right. It's, it, you shouldn't, and it's illegal and you should not be doing that. Yeah. Similar, I mean, that's a very extreme example of it, but it could, yeah. be, uh, it could be things like the example you gave uh, earlier about um, you know, choosing to, to get a treatment or not, right? Yeah. Um, very much an American value, very much American law that I have that choice to choose. At one point, it wasn't even a choice. At, even in American law, it was not a choice, sure. right? If I, if I go to the UK, completely a different set. If I go to Kenya, it's something else. If I go to Japan, it's completely a different set of cultural, cultural norm is very much uh, uh, subjective and it depends on, on that. So when you're thinking of this, uh, uh, ethics from from an AI perspective, do you see this future that the AI is it is as cultural as humans are, depending on where where they're from? That even the robots follow those ethics based on based on where they're from, not necessarily uh, you know a, a bigger picture or something like that. Yeah. So look, there are, there's um, at least two, I mean, there's lots of things to say here, but I'll say at least two things. The first thing to say is that it's true that ethical beliefs vary by culture, vary by individual. It doesn't follow from that that um, ethics, ethical facts, if there are any, vary by culture. That's one thing to say, right? So um, the fact that there's disagreement among various populations among what the right thing to do is doesn't show you that there's no fact of the matter. People disagree about all sorts of things and we don't assume, oh, then I guess there's no fact of the matter, right? So. People disagree about whether evolution occurred, about the shape of the earth, about whether wearing masks is an effective way of preventing the spread of the pandemic, of the virus. Um, but we don't say, well, everyone's got their own view, so I guess there's no truth to the matter. Um, rather we say, well, some of those things are really complicated. 
so in some cases it's reasonable disagreement. Um, in some cases it's unreasonable disagreement, like whether the earth is flat, that, you know, people think the earth is flat, they disagree with the, the, the rounders, but you know, <laughs> and they're wrong. that's not a reasonable disagreement at this point. Um, but nonetheless, the fact that there's disagreement doesn't show us that, you know, the earth can be round for me and it's um, flat for you. And so you can fall off the edge, but I can't, right? We don't think that. So the fact that there's ethical disagreement doesn't show that there's no facts to the matter about whether it's ethical. That's one thing to say. The second thing to say is that there's actually quite a bit of, um, of universality, right? So there's not, a, you know, which is not to say that there's not any exceptions, but most people think that cannibalism is, is unacceptable. Cannibalism, cannibalizing an unwilling participant uh, is unacceptable. Um, genocide, unacceptable. Um, murder, rape, unacceptable, right? So there's a lot of, um, if not universality, at least wide, very widespread agreement on a lot of um, ethical principles. The last thing to say is that when we're talking about at least what organizations need to do, they need to define their own ethical standards and act by them. So that's what risk mitigation looks like for a, um, you know, for your clients, my clients, any, you know, any private, you know, most any private company, they got to, they've got to define what their ethical standards are. Now, you might say something like this, well, look, we're going to use our, we're going to deploy our product in Sweden and Japan and India and Turkey, and they all have different cultural norms. So we should just go with what they're, whatever the, whatever the local culture and cultural norms are. It's very important to highlight that your judgment that it's acceptable, ethically acceptable to defer to what their culture says is itself an ethical judgment that you're making, right? So if you go to, you know, Cannibalandia, where cannibalism is really popular, you go to Cannibalandia and you want, you want to um, deploy your AI product there, or whatever it is, and you say, well, in Cannibalandia, they eat other people, so let's just go with that. That itself is an ethical judgment that you're making, that it's acceptable to defer to the norms of Cannibalandia. Uh, uh, and it might be a problematic ethical judgment that you're making, both in itself and reputationally. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, even if you look at just human cultures, and it is embedded in us, right? We we accept, I mean, or, or we try to accept each other's differences, right? You know, you you eat meat. Okay, what kind of meat do you eat? Is it chicken or beef? <laughs> or but I'm a vegetarian. That's against my religion to eat meat. And then there are people who eat meat, and but they don't want to eat. Uh, yeah. pork, for example, sure. or, you know, or I worship the cow and, and that's, uh, that's my God. And why are you eating my God? You know? Right. So, so if you think about from that perspective, there are many different, um, uh, point of view. And that's what I think that as the AI builds, that's those kind of cultural sensitivities. It cannot be like a common denominator that it, it should work for everybody. It doesn't work for everybody with 7 billion of us on earth. It doesn't work, you know? Yeah. With with uh, let's say if we are creation of a, a, a much uh, more intelligent being, right? And we are the artificial intelligence. We think we are natural, right? Uh, you know, maybe that culture is more advanced in creating us like this, the way we 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 are trying to create robots in yeah. artificial intelligence. You know, so uh, it, it's 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 perspective. It's perspective, and you have to kind of see what that kind of world kind of looks like. When if you are generating let's say in this uh, future that we fast forward, right? And I, I do want to come back to 2020. Let's say it's 2050 and, and we, we are generating and, and jobs are being done by robots and humans are just living it up, I guess, you know, and enjoying life. There is no monetary exchange of anything because everything is available, yeah. you know? Okay, we've gone Good fiction, I should, write, yeah. I, should write, I should write minority report or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in, in that kind of a scenario, I think it's a... Um, when you're looking at that sort of a world, I, I think the differences is what is the thing that's common about us, you know. And and when you're thinking about uh, even even I mean the example of eating meat, I, I use that as an example. In America, you have uh, all sorts of di different types of meat except for human meat. Uh, but when you go to uh, countries like India, uh, certain types of meat are not acceptable, you know, religious reasons, cultural reasons, and many other things. Yeah. If you go to uh, a country in the Middle East, pork is not available because that's against the religion of those people. Sure. Right. When when you it depends on, and if you go to uh, countries like maybe Japan or Korea, 
maybe because of availability of certain types of meats, maybe maybe it's it's adored more and it's it's more expensive than like seafood or something like that, you know. Sure. So I, I think that from that perspective, I think yeah, even the AI as we build it out, we have to take those kind of cultural differences into because that's what makes us human, yeah. right? Take take it into account so that um, even I see whether it's robots or AI being very cultural too like and and it may not uh, unless you program it in um uh, a robot in kenya is not going to work the same way in america you know or canada and you shouldn't expect that too because yeah. the cultural norms are very different in every yeah. country you know yeah. i think that's totally right i mean there's lots of times you need to take you need to take consideration of the cultural norms where you're deploying your ai 100 um one one other thing worth mentioning is that there are some things where it's um required by your religion, but you don't think it's, and so it's unethical for you to do it, but you don't think it's unethical of others to do it. So for instance, you might think, um, you might think, oh, if you're Jewish, you should be kosher. But if you're not Jewish, don't worry about it. Right? So I don't, you know, I might not eat it. I, I'm not kosher. But um, if I were, I might say something like, well, I won't eat a cheeseburger because um, you can't meet, mix meat and dairy. But um, if you're not Jewish, then feel free to go for it. There's nothing inherently or intrinsically unethical about it. It's just a requirement of the of of, of Judaism, right? Yeah. So it's not the case that everything that is unethical by the lights of a religion um, for its practitioners is thereby unethical for um, non-practitioners. Okay. It'll so just it. just to kind of uh, uh, kind of fast forward. Uh, what does virtue do? What, what do you do for your clients? Let's talk about some of those kind of examples. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, the, the main thing that I do is I help senior leaders to operationalize AI ethics, to figure out how to drive AI ethics into practice. Um, usually they're trying to do one of two things. They're trying to mitigate risks. Um, hey, we're, you know, we're dealing with a bunch of data. We're dealing with, um, we're building AI products. We know that there's a bunch of risks in doing so, and we want to make sure that our reputation is not in harm's way. Um, that's one. That's one major thing. Um, and then the other, the other reason people are drawn to it is that they want to be the most trustworthy people on the block, right? They want to. They want to be able to tell their potential clients, consumers, we take um, the welfare of people really seriously. We take ethics seriously. We don't prioritize profit over people. Um, your trust is the most important thing to us. Um, and by creating an ethics program, a data ethics program, or an AI ethics program, you've got a lot to brag about. Right. You don't just say it's not just a PR thing. Oh, yeah, we care about you. It's we care about you. And here's the proof. Here's here's all the measures we go to to ensure that we're trustworthy. Um, so that's primarily, you know, that's a lot of what I do. And then on the other side of things, let's call that like governance. Right. So how do we systematically create um, uh, create uh, ethically sound products? And how do we have ethically sound partnerships? And how do we confront ethical gray areas? What do we do? Um, and how can we do that efficiently, right? We don't just want all these sort of ad hoc conversations when things come up and say, you know, oh shit, what do we do about this? I don't know. You know, if you have a system in place, you can deal with those things efficiently. And then the other side of things will be things like product development. So you're developing a product and we'll do a kind of ethical risk analysis of that product, um, both in terms of what features it has, you know, should it have that feature? Should it not have that feature? What can you add to it or subtract to it to make it ethically more sound? Um, and then what are the, what are the, how do you articulate the ethical best practices for deployment of it? So, yep. you know, think about governance and product, but it's all around, um, eth you know, primarily ethical risk mitigation for product and governance. So how do you, uh, I mean, what do you think are the biggest op uh, obstacles in operationalizing uh, AI ethics in, in companies that you have seen? So there are a number of obstacles. None of them are insurmountable. Um, if you have buy-in from senior leaders, it's got to be driven by senior leaders. Um, these are the kinds of issues, the kinds of reputational risks that we're talking about. They're board, they're board issues. They're C-suite issues. And so you need to have that kind of buy-in. And if you don't, that's going to be a real problem. Um, short of that, if you have, you know, if, a, if someone comes to me and says, hey, listen, we've got buy-in from senior leadership, from the board, um, we have a budget for it. That's sometimes an obstacle, of course. Um, then the next issue is how do we build organizational awareness and buy-in from other people throughout the organization, right? How do we get how do we get our um, product developers 
to take it seriously? How do we get our product managers to take it seriously, to understand what the risks are and to, and to um, embed in their operations a certain set of responsibilities that will help us to mitigate, identify and mitigate those risks. Um, so building organizational awareness and then and building the kinds of infrastructure that you need in order to support people in, in those tasks, like making sure it's part of quarterly or annually re annual reviews, that they're living up to those responsibilities that they have. Um, yeah, I mean, those are, those are the biggest obstacles. Um, but once you have the political will of senior leadership, you have a budget for it. The next thing is just to um, show people throughout the organization that it's important. Oh, I should say it's not just <clears throat> those product developers, but you also want to educate, say, HR. Mm -hmm. or marketing, right? Because there are tons of AI vendors out there who are selling into marketing departments and to HR departments. And a lot of those things, they're not vetted for ethical risks. So, you know, one thing that goes on is that a lot of companies have outsourced their innovation to the startup community. Mm -hmm. And then they import risk, ethical risk, when they use those products. And because those startups are not doing an ethical risk due diligence, standardly, some of them are, but most of them aren't. And because a lot of businesses don't have the processes in place to properly vet for those ethical risks, you need to have your HR people and your marketing people understand what the risks are so that when something crosses their desk, they, they know to say, okay, this is a resume reading tool that'll really help us. But, you know, I know that there's a ton of bias in, in these algorithms and that sometimes it will disproportionately affect say black people. Um, Amazon learned this relatively recently when they tried developing a resume reading AI, but they could not figure out how to stop it from discriminating against black people. Um, you know, your HR person needs to know when those issues are possible so that they can give it to the appropriate person. So it's not just a product issue. It's not just an engineering person, an engineering issue. It's for everyone because you know, your HR people, your marketing people, they need to understand what those risks are so that they can ask the right questions at the appropriate time. Hmm. No, I, I think that if you look at um, uh, technology and, and the way I've seen it over the past um, at least 25 years, right? There have been a lot of mistakes in the, in the earlier days of technology, right? Whatever that technology was. And then as as more people got involved from other industries, because before, you know, in the very beginning, it was in someone's basement and it was a bunch of nerds like me trying to program and do cool stuff, right? Yeah. And and uh, but when you're doing that, but you don't know the all the other aspect of it, because all you're doing is creating, uh, you know, funny characters on the screen, playing yeah. music, whatever you're doing, you're doing uh, fun stuff. But when you are, and then you're utilizing that knowledge to actually create other things that you want to create, right? Um, but then more and more, when you get more and more adoption, that's where, you know, more of that kind of uh, ethical values and other types of things that people purely technical may not have that in them. It, yeah. It's just not part of their DNA, you know? Cool. Not that they're intentionally leaving it out. It's just... It's not just part of them. It's not them. Well, it's not they're, they're not a sociologist. Right? They're not an anthropologist. And what I have seen over the over the past twenty five years, uh, how my career grew. In the very beginning, I I'm, I I was expected. Even now, I'm expected to be everything in the organization. However, when I see the retail side of the business, there there is a whole organization that handles that, not just one person. Sure. You know, so I always find it funny that a, a title like director of e commerce, right? But I don't see director of retail. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right, yeah, There's yeah. no such thing, you know. So I, I think it's just the evolution of the industry, and as as it uh, as it evolves, I think, especially in the in the area of AI, the, uh, understanding the ethics of it, understanding uh, and, and understanding what that involves, and and what what does ethics mean? That's why I was asking you, yeah. if I'm in a different geography, my ethics might be completely different. It may be influenced by my religion, by my whatever those kinds of things are. And, and some of those questions, I don't even know what they are. I don't know yeah. what questions I'm going to ask about yeah. ethics in 2030, right? Yeah. Because things might look different because of adoption of artificial intelligence or, or, or artificial beings and stuff like that, you know? So I have no idea what those things are. Yeah. But once, once we get there, as long as we are making those kind of decisions and just like, you know, there is no one program, right? 
in computer science, you're yeah. doing C++. You're not writing one piece of code that does everything sure, right? yeah. for, for everybody. You have different fonts for every language. You have different currencies. I, I think a similar kind of thing, I mean, those are very simple examples that I'm giving you, but related to artificial intelligence, just like we probably are viewed as artificial intelligence that are the, the way we are made, right? Uh, you know, and but we, we have evolved over time that now we're, we're trying to make that change happen with these artificial, whether it's intelligence and it's just an algorithm or it's an artificial being that we are creating like robots, yeah. you know? We really need to see what um, what the ethics look like, how can it be programmed? Maybe it's even cultural um, or, or is there a universal code? Whose code is it? Is it American code? Australians would be really pissed, you know? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And someone from Saudi Arabia will go like, well, it doesn't have any of my religious beliefs in here, so I'm not yeah. gonna. What is this? You know, we, we're not yeah. gonna allow this here. You yeah. know, so that's that's the kind of thing I think it would be driven. I don't know if we are, from your perspective, uh, you know, just kind of seeing the evolution you have seen in AI and and data and stuff like that and ethics related to it. I, I think a lot of that adoption needs to be part of it, just like understanding the laws. Human beings understand the laws, but still people break those laws yeah. and they get punished for those laws. But when when a you know now I'm going Hollywood now when a robot when your robot breaks the law, uh, does that mean that you broke the law, you know, or is it the manufacturer that sold you that vacuum cleaner that's intelligent, yeah. you know? Right. Yeah. So, what what are your thoughts on that? On the on if my robot, uh, you know, kills robot, robot vacuum cleaner that kills people. Yeah. 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 I mean, look, it's unlikely to be your fault because why you might own the product, you're not responsible for the way in which it was developed, right? So it's unlikely that it's going to be your responsibility. But, but Reed, I, I drive a car and, and nowadays we're thinking about automation, right? And there's uh, automation in cars now that it's self-driving, right? Your hand has to be there. But sure. let's say if that car gets into an accident, like purely ethical standpoint, is that a manufacturer's fault or is it you because you were sitting there and your hand was on it even though the automation was driving that car? Yeah, so it's going to, it's, it's going to depend upon um, a number of factors. Um, number one is whether it's sort of true self-driving or if it's assisted driving. Um, if it's true self-driving and the message that you've been told is you don't really have to pay attention, then it's unlikely that you should be considered ethically responsible for the mayhem. Now, if it's something like assisted living, assisted living, assisted driving, um, it's something like assisted driving, um, and you get into an accident, but it happened in such a way that there's no way that you could have caught that in time, right? That the, that the things, that this chain of events unfolded so quickly that you couldn't reasonably have been expected to step in and alter things, um, then you should be held ethically responsible. Um, on the other hand, if you know it's not fully self-driving and you have the time to properly react and you don't do it, then probably you're gonna be ethically responsible. Well, what if the algorithm went wrong? You know, And even though you're sitting there, you have your hands on the steering wheel and you're trying to apply the brake. Yeah. The car goes and smashes into a crowd of people. Yeah, then it seems like it's not gonna be your fault, right? I mean, if you, if you tried to prevent it, you had the time to prevent it and you tried to prevent it and you took the reasonable, reasonable efforts to prevent it, um, in fact, all available efforts to prevent it, but nonetheless, things go awry because the machine is defective. Doesn't look like it's your that you're, you're ethically at fault. So, given we're talking I'll, I'll about make one exception, if you are yeah. already put your, if you put yourself in the reckless situation, right? So, if you slam on, you know, let's say it's post pandemic or pre pandemic, and you start driving, you know, you close your eyes driving into Times Square. Um, and there's you know tons of people around, and then you decide, no, actually, I don't want to kill everyone. I'm going to hit the brake, but it doesn't work because there's a malfunction, and you run into a bunch of people. Then there's an extent to which you're at fault because you put yourself in a position where, when the machine goes defective, it does some so much um, havoc. Yeah, I mean the topic I'm des uh, describing here. I think there's a lot to be said, uh, whether it's regulators, politicians, laws, governments you know, or, or governance, not necessarily government, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, in case of companies, governance, governance, you know, just like IT has governance in, in companies. Um, where do you, 
where do you place your kind of your future uh, predictions into ethics of AI uh, when it when it comes to those kinds of uh, topics? That's a good question. I don't really know the answer. I mean, I'll tell you what the trend has been. Um, and it's been the trend has been um, occurring out surprisingly fast, um, which is that <clears throat> the tech community in particular is taking AI ethics increasingly seriously. Um, <clears throat> I became, you know, I think they started talking about it, you know, a few years ago, but I would say over the past three years, and especially over the past year, year and a half, interest around it has absolutely skyrocketed. So you now have dozens and dozens of people at Microsoft who work on AI ethics issues and, and AI ethical risk mitigation. You have Facebook created recently over the, I think it was over this, just over this past summer, a responsible innovation department. Um, and part of their purview is AI ethics, but they do all sorts of ethical issues. Um, <clears throat> Amazon is tackling the issue now with people with a, with a global AI ethics lead. Um, every tech company that I know of, a uh, big tech company, uh, you know, the big five, they have, they're, they're taking it seriously in some capacity. They're at least starting to. So we're at the first wave of AI ethics. More specifically, we're at the first wave of operationalizing AI ethics. And it will, it is increasingly not just those big tech companies, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, that are doing these things, but it's increasingly um, happening in the startup world. And it's increasingly happening in other kinds of businesses. Um, but it's really, it's early days. So I expect to see over the next five years, a huge effort. First of all, there's going to be tons of, there's going to be regulation first coming out of the EU. Um, that's going to happen, I would say, relatively soon, or at least what the regulations will be will come out soon when they're enforced is another issue. Um, and we're going to see loads of companies taking the stuff seriously because they need to protect their reputations and to, and to uh, make their brands trustworthy. Thank you, Reed, for joining us and, and sharing uh, your thoughts on uh, on uh, AI and, and data data and AI ethics. Uh, you know, it's a it's a very interesting uh, field for me, and and I, I learned quite a lot just during this interview. Yeah, good. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, as humanity, I think we we just need to um, uh, you know, because there are a lot of Hollywood versions of the yeah. story of what could happen. You know. But I think it's funny. Some sometimes uh, Hollywood is right about the future. You know, when when it does happen, and and we should be very open to kind of considering those whether it's AI ethics or who's responsible type things, and uh, making sure that we uh, address it. And uh, for our audience, if you want to visit a read on the web, it's virtueconsultants.com. That's his website. Correct. That's the right link. Yeah, that, yeah you can go there. You can find me on LinkedIn. Definitely. Sometimes I post on Twitter, but I really don't like it. <laughs> you, you don't want Twitter to know that. I just, I just always forget. <laughs> All right. Well, Reed, thank, thank you for, for being on uh, this week with Sabir. Really appreciate it. And oh, it's audience, my thanks for having me. And thank you, audience, for tuning in and, and consuming this uh, content. Thank you.